So today we're going to talk about open services and Filecoin. I don't have to tell you about open source. It's pretty much running the majority of our infrastructure these days. Uh, I think if you, at this point, haven't interacted with an open source project, you probably haven't interacted with much software at all. Um, it's, it's really hard to stay away from open source these days. This wasn't always the case, though. For a long time, open source was at the fringe, and only fringe projects uh, used open source. Separate from open source, there's an emergence of what I like to call open services, things that are like open source, but they're not about creating an artifact or a code base, but they're about creating a network that provides a service, something that isn't directed by a corporation or a foundation or anything like that. It's just a service that, with a protocol, and the protocol itself runs the network. You can think of Bitcoin as the first example, uh, first really solid example of an open service reaching you know, planetary scale and a you know, huge amount of people using it and, and near perfect uptime. Uh, you know, the, you know, this is, you know, I took this from a website that supposedly tracks the uptime of the Bitcoin network. Four nines is pretty good, not quite five nines, but getting there. Uh, you can think of the number of transactions per block. You know, there's clearly a lot going on here. And it's been running now. You know, the project is about, about going to be 10 years old. Uh, it's been running for a very long time. And through this whole period, there have been, of course, hiccups. But what's remarkable to show is that there is no centrally managed, centrally planned thing going on here. This is a, a protocol run by a whole bunch of participants, mutually distrusting, that manage to provide a useful service to the network. Uh, this is my favorite graph in the, entire, uh, in the entire Bitcoin and blockchain ecosystem. This is the hash rate of, of Bitcoin. It's pretty terrifying when you, when you think about all of the wasted work that that represents. But you know, it's, it's amazing that, that this exponential uh, growth of, of computing dedicated to, to Bitcoin is, is actually sustaining uh, over so long, such a long period of time. I started taking this graph in 2014, and I keep getting astonished at, at, the, at the rate of, of, of growth. And it's pretty cool that like, we've almost gotten rid of, like, there, there used to be these, these chunks cut into the graph when Bitcoin crashed in price in, I think, 2013 or so. Um, maybe it was 14, where Bitcoin crashed in price significantly, and then a lot of miners turned off. So the, so the hatch rate had this like, weird chunk cut out of it. Uh, but it's almost gone now. Uh, Ethereum is the same thing. Ethereum has a huge network of miners as well. Um, it has its own set of transactions. Um, I don't know what happened in January or December. Was that CryptoKitties or something? Uh, or maybe the huge uh, bump in price. Uh, then we can actually look at the name registrations. That's actually interesting here. This is not cumulative. This is you know, per day. I think there are in the, in the dozens of names registered per day. And you know, at the beginning, you can see this huge land, land grab to try and like, register a whole bunch of names in ENS. Um, and so we'll see how this turns out in the long ter on the long term. But we can see that this is a, a service, again, that is run by mutually distressing parties, um, assembled through a protocol, uh, assembled through a, a bunch of participants agreeing on, on what to provide and how to do it, and competition. So this is an interesting combination of both competition and collaboration to provide a useful service to the network. Uh, side note, I don't know what, um, what this will look like in a long time, but uh, I wonder what the DNS registration graph looks like. What, what was the DNS registration at the beginning, and how long did it take to accumulate? Of course, a very different time, a lot, lot less people, a lot less organizations on the internet, um, but it'd be interesting to see what, uh, uh, how those two relate. So let's start thinking about designing open services. Let's, let's start uh, thinking not just of producing open source software and putting it out there and so on, but really think of engineering uh, system, human systems to provide these uh, useful, valuable uh, network services to humanity, especially applying it to a lot of things that right now are run by centrally managed corporations that have problems. Um, so one of, the, one of the interesting, you know, I, I've been thinking about what are, what are the properties of things like open services. Uh, first of all, you know, they're probably open source. Uh, you probably can fork them. Uh, that's, that's a very important piece that you should be able to fork not just the code, but also the value, um, the value and the protocol itself, uh, so that you can have disagreements in organizations and they can split off without having to start from scratch. Um, you probably also want permissionless entry, like the ability of new market participants to come in uh, and join the protocol and provide value without having to uh, pay any kind of rent to the, to the previous stakeholders. Uh, and it should also, of course, provide some service to the network over time. Otherwise, 
what are you doing? But the important thing here is the overtime thing. Uh, open source has been extremely successful at producing, again, this, these artifacts of, of code and, and other kinds of things. But they're, they're these pieces that you create, and they're, you know, they're digital, and they're, they live in the network. And people don't have to maintain them over time necessarily. Of course, there's maintenance to open source, but that is not a constant service. Like, who's going to get paged uh, in the middle of the night if, if some build fails uh, in an open source project? That rarely happens, but there usually is a, uh, some other set of value incentives there. Uh, who's going to get, uh, you know, are you going to have like perfect uptime in, in the listing of your code and so on? Like, this, this is a fundamentally different set of properties that we're thinking about. Uh, the last things that, that matter here, I think it's the, the emergence of incentive structures is what made this possible. So a lot of people tried running open services before, uh, before the creation of cryptocurrencies and so on, but there was always this hard question of, you know, when you run a commons, when you run a, a service together, there are freeloaders, and, the, and then the maintenance burden uh, becomes pretty large on a few parties. And so the, the addition of incentive structures into these systems is a key component to make these things um, have a high probability of, of being served well over long periods of time. And, and the last thing I think is pretty key is that these services should allow the optimization of value, meaning they shouldn't entrench some badly or poorly optimized structure, and they should over time tend towards uh, making sure that the service is provided as cheaply as possible or like some, the set of properties are maximized. So you know, think of programmable value creation networks with these kind of incentive structures and economic structures that rival firms. So we no longer have to incorporate in a, in a legal jurisdiction, which is, when you think about incorporating an entity, you're, you're calling some code on a, on a legal system. And this is you know, the most ancient programming language that we know. And you know, it's been, had many, many different revisions. But in these days, the, the legal structures are not the same as you know, compiled code. So if you, want, if you can move to compiled code and gain, gain a lot of understanding of whether your thing is going to work beforehand, that would be great. Um, and you no longer have to you know, call into this whole structure and register humans as leaders of this organization and centrally manage everything and, and all, that, all that stuff. You can just provide a service, create a protocol, and run it on the network. So I think this is going to be a very important shift uh, that we're going to see take over a lot uh, many, many more kinds of services, not just things like payments and financial industry things, but it's going to seep into a lot of the other things that we use day to day in, 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 in the internet, in mobile, and so on. So I think that these things are all ripe for becoming open services. It's hard. It's actually really, really, really hard to compete with these, these players. It's extremely difficult to, to conceive of something um, you know, potentially replacing Twitter or, or, um, you know, or Facebook or whatever. But, but, but do remember that you know, back in the day there were giants like IBM and there were you know, a whole bunch of, the, the history of computing is, is a history of like, huge uh, groups uh, creating huge incumbents and then over time getting replaced by, by new things. And I think that the, the advantages that open services have, especially when it comes to value alignment with the people that are actually participating in the open service uh, are key here, and they will, they will lead to the replacement of some of these things uh, with open alternatives. Uh, we're already seeing issues when it comes to you know, a lot of the communication services that we use uh, and what happens when those are run by for-profit corporations that are maximizing the value generated through advertising. Right? Like we, if, if you are not aware of the ills of the advertising model, uh, uh, start looking around at like what, what is happening when you have a, an, an entire massive system that, capture, that is designed to capture your attention as much as possible and extend the amount of time that you're, that you're um, spending on that service so that they can maximize the ad revenue that comes from that. And uh, you know, there's, there's great research that shows that you know, things like YouTube, for example, uh, will lead you towards like, more and more radical versions of whatever you're watching, um, simply because that's likely to lead to you staying there for longer periods of time. And so that, that profit maximization for that service as the way it's constructed there in, with that business model is pretty damaging to a lot of people uh, in the world. So ideally, we would be able to create the same kind of high-quality, great reliability services, but do it in a way that is much more aligned with the value systems of the users using them. And what was missing was the incentive structures to make sure that those things can have high uptimes and that can be replaced over time and that it's not like you know, community-run uh, community service that you know, falls apart all the time because that, that's just not going to ever win with some 
with some really high quality uh, service. But now with these incentive structures, we can do it. Uh, so I encourage you to, to explore the possibilities here and try to think about how to uh, create open alternatives, open service alternatives to these things. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is real-time service markets. So think of things like, like Uber and Airbnb. These are, these are interesting to me because they're, they're a point halfway through, right? So it's a, a group of people recognized that there were these huge untapped resources, and they created a marketplace, and, and they deployed this digitally managed uh, marketplace for all of these participants to bring in their resources and be able to resell them in the network to other players. But the, again, an issue here is these are, run, these are centrally managed, and a lot of the value capture of these systems is going to the, the initial corporation that created this thing and, and the investors of these, of these systems, as opposed to the, you know, the, the majority of the participants contributing the, the bulk of the value here um, are, are, of course, getting rewards. I mean, it, it, people do host an Airbnb because it makes economic sense for them, uh, but they're not capturing the same kind of upside rewards that, that something like actually being part of the company would give you. And so what's interesting about these open services, especially when it comes to things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all of the token networks that we're seeing, is that there's a way of sharing that upside potential with the participants of the network. And that's pretty huge. Uh, I, we haven't really seen something like this um, before. Uh, things like uh, you know, participation in, in, in the upside of creating something um, at that level, permissionless, without having to form an agreement, a legal agreement anywhere or anything like that, is pretty uh, amazing. So let's, again, use these tools to build valuable services. Uh, so now I'll talk about Falcon, which is one of these, these kinds of things. And uh, you know, briefly mentioned, this is built by, um, by Protocol Labs, which is a, a research lab focused on, on this pipeline, what we, what we describe as the ideas to human superpowers pipeline of going from, from things on, on paper and things in your mind to, you know, in, in the, the research process, uh, over time polishing that into, into reliable protocols and specs that could then be turned into solid, solid code that you can depend on and, and open source libraries that you can use in all your applications, and then over time yielding to actual, you know, programs that you're going to run in your, in your computers, whether it's mobile or, or your computer and so on. And... In, in a big way, the software that you use today confers you a significant amount of power. Just consider what you do day to day and the, the communication possibilities that you have and the, the capability of, of collaboration or, or information retrieval or, or just access to computation um, as distinguishing you from people, say, 50 years ago or 100 years ago or, or 300 years ago. Just think of the potential that you have as an individual living in this moment in time is dramatically more powerful than people then. Um, you know, even if you were like at the top of the of the economic food chain or whatever back then, you didn't have the the, the degree of power in certain areas that you do today. Uh, so we think we think that uh, investing deeply and in making sure that this can go faster and better, uh, and making sure that protocols are, and good ideas don't get stuck in this pipeline is a very important part of uh, of these things. And I describe this because. Um, this is why we work on a whole bunch of independent projects. We're, we're not working on a, a specific, um, on, on one thing only. We're working on a number of things that are related and interconnected and producing uh, value together. And we are, you know, forming our, our proper research lab is, is starting to, to uh, publish things. We started with a number of technical reports last year. Um, we're uh, going to be looking at, uh, at submitting a whole bunch of, oh, whoops. Yeah, there we go. Uh, we're going to be writing a lot more this year uh, and next year and so on. And you know, if you want to work with us, please uh, come by. We're a highly collaborative organization, so, so definitely reach out. Um, and you know, we'll have RFPs uh, and so on for interesting open problems that we find. So Filecoin is at the, st at the, at the top of the protocol lab stack. Um, and you know, we're building a whole bunch of these independent pieces that, again, are usable on their own right. So a lot of the projects that, um, that depend on things like IPFS but we're going to use a lot of our software using some component in the stack that, it, that provides value to them. Things, again, like IPFS, WP, and, and so on. Uh, I won't talk much about IPFS, but suffice it to say that it is a project that works on these problems. Things like uh, changing how the links are structured on the network, giving content addressing to, to, to how information flows, dealing with things like offline use, censorship, and so on. 
Um, the big key thing is here, like map human readable names to hashes directly, as opposed to mapping to, say, location addresses that then have this big problem that once you point to a location, then whoever controls the location can change the content underneath the hood or can prevent you from accessing it and so on. So the, the big change that IPFS is pushing is this. Uh, you can find out about more, more about IPFS on the network. Uh, one big question that we always get is, can it do dynamic content? Yes, uh, you can build chat systems and you know, Google Docs style uh, collaboration tools with it. And these are demos that you can check out. Uh, one big thing in, that makes, uh, that is always confusing to people is that IPFS does not give you the incentive structure for, for, what, for sharing the files. It just leaves that to a higher layer. Meaning at the bottom, we, we answer the question of you know, how do you connect to each other? What are the peers in the network and so on? Uh, on top of that, we say, you know, we model the data, IPFS models the data and thinks about how the distribution of the data would work. And then on top of that, we answer the question of, you know, who actually stores, stores the data? Because that is a very context dependent, dependent thing. It depends on the users, it depends on the application, it depends on a whole bunch of factors that, that are not knowable at the lower protocol layers. So who stores your IPFS data? Well, it could be yourself. Could be a cluster of participants that work together to store this, this data. This is a, another project. Or it could be the network as a whole. So, so the network as a whole here would be a specific service. Think of um, something like a, a cloud storage provider, or something like uh, Amazon. And in this case, that's, that's where Filecoin fits in. It's a, it's a specific network that you hire to store your data for you. Um, but again, it's one answer to, it, to the problem. So thinking about the, the Filecoin model, the, uh, think about the, you know, the, there's a large network of participants. They can be honest, malicious, or rational. We know how to do payments over a network like this. We know how to distribute files uh, with integrity over a network like this. But it would be great to be able to hire participants in the network to store the data for you and give you a, a record validating that they're, they're indeed uh, storing it. Uh, these are the kinds of problems that Falcon addresses. Uh, there's another talk that goes deeper into this uh, that I gave at BPACE. Uh, Earlier in the year, I encourage you to check it out because I dive deep into the, the, the reasoning behind each of these problems. Here, suffice it to say that the, there's a huge problem in, in cloud storage in general where it's not a properly open market. You can enter as a, as a whole storage provider, but the degree of things that you need to do to compete as a storage provider is enormous. Um, you have to uh, have a huge amount of storage to be able to deal with, with clients of arbitrary size. You have to uh, be geo-replicated, you have to be in a whole bunch of regions, you have to have low latencies everywhere, you have to have a, a great uptime, great customer service, have a, a great company policies, and so on. So the, the list goes on, and so it's not, easy, it's, not, it's not easy to compete with large players like Amazon and Google, and it's not hard to see how these large players, one-to-one, -one, would defeat every other participant in the network, or you know, the majority of the small players. But this is what markets are for. So, so when we created the, the concept of markets, uh, this is exactly the kind of problem that we wanted to solve. So let's level the playing field there and enable the aggregation of the small participants or the smaller participants, sometimes they're pretty big already, and use that to build one single storage service. Um, and over time, make, make the storage service capable of optimizing the value flows, meaning don't let incumbents that just develop um, a strong, strong network effect uh, and a big moat to... Uh, prevent the entry of other participants who could yield much better uh, cost structures. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff around how, um, you know, decentralization and the value of that and so on that I, w that I won't go into here, just out of time. The pieces to remember uh, about this is that, you know, the, the goal is to build a decentralized network where no participant controls it, make it efficient and make it optimize the value flows. Um, make it robust and, and capable of dealing with a whole bunch of, of failures and, and so on. Even things like network partitions, which you don't see a lot of people in, in blockchain networks thinking about. Um, or, or not thinking about a, as how, to maintain, uh, how to maintain availability during a network partition. And, and build that as a foundation for, for information in a way that does not depend on any single entity. It, it would be great that when you, when you write something digitally, we have the same kind of property as when you publish a book. Right, so today, if you go and write something and you publish a book, uh, yeah, you, there's publishers and so on, but once people have the, the information, it, it's, you no longer have to rely on the publishers or that uh, chain of service providers. The information is out and people have it and they can uh, continue reading it as much as they want, they can continue sharing it and so on. 
And that's different from, from how digital information works today, where if you store something on the network, you have to rely on all of these uh, service providers continuing to serve your content for you um, uh, indefinitely. And, and ideally, you know, when, when you place your trust in a, in a single corporation, you have all of these problems associated with the future of that corporation and whether or not they're going to change the business model, whether or not they're going to they're survive, whether or not gonna, they're, they're going to decide to kick you out at some point for whatever reason. Maybe you're not their, their, their final like, um, target market or something. And so ideally, we could move the computing infrastructure that we have to a much more robust and, and free foundation. Uh, so the, the Falcon Protocol is described in the technical paper. I encourage you, highly encourage you to go and, and read that. Um, and there's also a, a couple of um, there's a f more talks now that I haven't listed here, but um, this during the first half of this year, I'll be giving a number of talks that go deeper into different parts of the protocol. Here, I'll just give an overview. Uh, the pieces uh, to think about are, you know, we want to provide useful proof of work consensus. We want to allow the optimization of the storage, and we want to again provide in a decentralized fashion. So IPFS handles most of the decentralized part. So this is where Falcon just builds on top of IPFS. Um, optimization of the storage, this is where we employ markets, and I'll describe that a little bit more later. But the key contribution here uh, is building a useful proof of work consensus that can use valuable or useful storage uh, to maintain the network. So again, this is my, my favorite graph in the, in the, in the uh, whole blockchain ecosystem. It's the hash rate of Bitcoin. This was last year. This was like halfway through um, last year, and then this is how it grew to the beginning of this year, I already showed you the, the other graph where it was even steeper. Forgot to update it here, but you know this is this is the rate of growth of this this thing. Um, th that is how much computation was added to the network since you know the, the last graph was taken, um, contributing to to maintaining the, the the ledger. So so and the problem here is um, the amount of energy that this is consuming is is breathtaking. Like the, this is uh, again last year it was about. Uh, it surpassed Slovenia as a, as a, you know, that's a significant sized country, um, and the Bitcoin network was consuming more energy than all of Slovenia. I think now, uh, I haven't done the calculation again, but it's, it's dramatically higher. Uh, and I've heard, again, need to validate this, that it's about a one, one five hundredth of the energy on the planet. That to me is, seems like way too big, but if that's the case, that's absolutely terrifying. That amount of energy being consumed to just maintain this network. But it gives you an idea of what happens when you create a very simple structure for participants to come in with an incentive structure to, um, to, for participants to come in and provide some value to the network. So this is the power of open services, right? This open service happens to be optimizing for hashes in the network, hash rate in the network. Uh, ideally, we would be able to use uh, some of this computation to do something valuable. Because um, it is securing the network, but it's not providing more utility beyond that. Uh, it's not hard to see why people are doing this. So this, is, this was the mining revenues you know, halfway through last year. Then prices went up, so it went up to this amount. They've now you know, crashed to about half of that. But it's still increasingly, it's still amazingly large. Right? So when you, when you think of all of the, the potential, um, uh, if, you, if there is a token here that has significant value, this is why entrants are, are going into this. This is why the open service works. It's because there's a significant um, Value potential to be ma value to be made there, and and participants can join the network to take a piece of that of that value. And there, this is where competition factors in. You you create this huge potential price, and then a lot of participants in the network are all competing with each other to try and maximize their their the return of that fraction of that price. So let's take something like the Bitcoin structure that you know created these these huge mining mining networks, um, and do it do it usefully to provide a huge storage service in the in the world. So let's create the open service of cloud storage. Um, through an incentive structure that is, that is similar, uh, and that's what Falcon is about. Uh, the model works like this. You, you have clients that want storage and providers that, you know, miners that provide storage, and the network sort of sits in the middle um, managing these interactions. Of course, the network is virtual, so it's um, built by the, by the miners. It's, it's just like a virtualized uh, structure. Um, but you can think of the network acting as an intermediary um, between the, these participants and making sure that the interactions are correct. So the clients provide data and money to the network. The network locks up the money, provides the data to the providers. And then over time, the providers um, give proofs that they're indeed storing the information. If that checks out, then the network will pay out the miners over time. And, and it's critical here that the network uh, is robust to potential you know, malicious participants. right? So um, the, the clients need to be able to trust the network to 
to work, even in the presence of you know, a significant fraction of malicious or rational nodes. So one of the big things here is the majority of, of participants will be, will be um, uh, rational. They won't necessarily be malicious. But if there is an incentive to cheat, they will. And another big thing here is clients will also, may also have incentives to cheat. And it's understanding that, that key here that in a decentralized storage network, different from central, centralized storage networks, um, the model is one where any participant could be malicious, and you have to build a robust system that, that can tolerate those, those kinds of uh, structures. This is a, you know, an overview of the protocol. won't go into it. Um, I mentioned that it, we create markets, and that happens with two pieces, a storage market for when people add uh, storage to the network, and a retrieval market. That This, this happens in, in an off-chain uh, state and payment channel network uh, so that you can get low-latency retrieval. Uh, we use a whole bunch of components to build the consensus. Uh, the next talk will talk about proofs of replication. Um, this is an interesting thing that came out of, 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 our, of the, the work on Filecoin. It was thinking about proofs of storage. You'll get a, a, an awesome in-depth um, description about what are proofs of storage and how, how proofs of rep replication work and so on. Um, the big thing there to think about is how do you prove that you're storing data for some, some of the else, for, for the network. And uh, yeah, I think like this is, uh, again, all of the going through the entire consensus protocol and showing how it works is in another talk that you can watch online. Uh, thanks very much. The last thing I'll mention is uh, keep this in mind in, in, you know, in the recent year, in the last year and a half, and in the future. Remember that, uh, you know, definitely read this book, Technological Revolutions of Financial Capital. Think about when um, technology is getting built. Over time, there usually is a decoupling of, of, the, uh, of the value provided with um, with the hype, and so you know this leads to the creation of a whole bunch of asset bubbles, and this is an issue. And so you know we're starting to see that happen. There's a bunch of scams out there, and there's a bunch of things going on. So just remember that this is first of all it happens, and second, given that it happens, like <laughs> understand that and then deal with things correctly. And uh, remember that in the in the last bubble, there were definitely a bunch of things that didn't make it, um, but there were also think, a lot of things with of great value created and living through that bubble. So the, last two the first graph is the NASDAQ. The last two graphs are the Amazon stock price and the Apple stock price during that period of time. Uh, and so you know, it was a b the, the whole bubble was a blip in Amazon's history. So just remember that. Um, and so in the meantime, keep calm, build a spaceship, fold, focus on the technology, because that's what we're here for. Uh, and like, don't, like, try not to speculate on things you don't understand. Please don't do that. That's bad. Uh, just focus on the tech that you understand. And uh, I'll leave you with this. Thank you. This was probably one of the most important things to happen last year.